Okay, um, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the sixth lecture of the 2015 Shanghai Lectures. Um, today we'll have um, a lecture about developmental robotics and specifically language. And we're today hosting from Plymouth University, um, myself and Anthony Morse here. Um, the <clears throat> program for today originally looked like this. So we had, um, we'll have Anthony's lecture, then discussion coffee break and then a guest lecture. Um, unfortunately, um, our guest lecture uh, had a technical problem, so we'll be rescheduled for a future lecture. Um, and we've uh, switched things around a little bit, so we'll give um, Anthony a bit more time for his talk um, and for questions. Um, so please feel free to, to stop him during the talk if you have any questions and also to discuss the content afterwards. Um, so we'll have a, a coffee break around 10.15 maybe. Uh, then we'll have a surprise talk by Fabio, uh, an additional talk. Um, and if there are any remaining sites that want to introduce themselves, uh, please let us know and we'll do that uh, towards the end. And we'll try to wrap up um, at on time or, or a little bit earlier. Um, I'll just quickly introduce the main speaker. Um, so um, Anthony Morse is a senior research fellow uh, in the Center for Robotics and Neural Systems at the University of Plymouth. He has a research interest in uh, developmental robotics, in particular the role embodiment space in language plays in shaping cognition. Um, so he's uh, quite experienced in this area, uh, and uh, really looking forward to his talk. Um, and I think we can, since I'm not introducing the guest speaker, we can now switch over to Tony. So what I'll do is I'll stop sharing. And then Tony can share. Yeah. There we go. See that? Yes, perfect. So I've been asked to talk about developmental robotics and specifically language. Um, I don't think that you can talk about language without talking a little bit about the rest of the as well. It's, it's not modules that you can do with or without. <coughs> so, developmental robotics, it's not just robotics and AI, but uh, ethology, neuroscience, psychology, linguistics, and, and many other subjects as well. So developmental robotics is interdisciplinary. And so as a bit of a warning, so is this lecture. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the history of cognitive modeling a little bit. So this is Alan Newell. He was, uh, so Newell and Simon were both at the Dartmouth conference in 1956, which was the, the historical birth of artificial intelligence. But Newell wasn't a computer scientist or a roboticist. He was a psychologist. And some years later, he, um, in writing a, a paper, sort of as a summary of a symposium from a psychology conference, he really questioned what it, what will it take for psychology to become a mature science. So he said things like, um, suppose that in the next 30 years we continue as we're now going. Another 100 phenomena, give or take a few dozen, will have been discovered and explored. Another 40 oppositions will have been posi posited and their resolution initiated. Will psychology then have come of age? And obviously, more than 30 years later, I think clearly the answer is no. What he was implying in a way was that psychology shows you what the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle look like, but doesn't make a a disciplined effort to put them together. Or maybe it makes the effort, but hasn't got the right methodology to put them together. So he made some suggestions. He wasn't just criticizing. He was really optimistic about the future of psychology and said, our task in psychology is first to discover that structure which is fixed and invariant so that we can theoretically infer the methods of cognition and learning. 
And to do that, he suggested that we need to build models, um, build models that can reproduce data from psychology experiments. And by doing so, instead of having sort of loose boxologies or flow charts of how, how co cognition might work, um, you're forced to fill in the details. So to do that, we need to accept a single task and model all of it. So it's no good if your model just replicates data from one experiment. Yeah. Um, the fact that it does does not imply that people are using the same method. You need to capture all the subtleties, all the variations of a, a range of experiments around a task. And finally, he, he suggested that not only that, that we should stay with this diverse collection of small experimental tasks as, as now, as psychology does, um, but construct a single system to perform them all. And to date, no one has really been able to do that. He was a strong advocate of production systems, and I think he was involved in creating the very the first production system. So production systems like ACT, R, and SOAR, these are um, overriding frameworks that really constrain how you build a model. And they also, um, through, you know, through the development of lots of new models and the refinement of parameters, <laughs> I've disappeared <laughs> off the screen. <laughs> um, by refining the, the parameters, the, the idea was that the production system itself might come to resemble some theory of cognition. Um, now, unfortunately, production systems, this is a bit of a caricature, but production systems look a bit like this. So you might have built a model of subtraction, and somebody else has built a model of memory, and I've built a model of word puzzles or whatever. And these are isolated islands that don't really connect to each other. They make different assumptions, even though you have all these constraints of the production system. And they certainly don't connect to the sensory surface or the motor surface. These are ab really abstract models. And so as a motivation for developmental robotics, well, robotics, at least minimally, has to connect all the way from the sensory surface to the motor surface. If it doesn't do that, if there's a break in that connection, then your robot doesn't work or isn't autonomous. So you have to minimally connect to these uh, to the sensory and motor surface. And anything that you want to add to the robot, any new ability, any whether it's cognitive or behavioral or whatever, it has to integrate somehow. So as a methodology, what robotics does is forces you to do the kinds of integration that was missing from production systems. So um, I'm going to talk about one particular architecture, the epigenetic robotics architecture, and I'm going to go through a, a whole range of different experiments from bodily bias, mutual exclusivity, fast mapping, language, um, compositionality, generalization, grounded grammar learning, and developmental stages and transitions. So I'm going to talk about a series of experiments covering all of these areas. So this is hopefully attempting to do what Neil was, was arguing needed to be done. Um, and hopefully this will all make sense. But in order to motivate how this works, we have to start thinking about um, what, what cognition is and what language is, how the two relate. So this is a nice quote from, um, ben, uh, from Moshi Bar who is a neuroscientist, um, or in fact, he's a neurosurgeon. He says, is it possible that much of the brain and mind's operation can be explained with a small set of universal principles? Given exciting recent developments in theory, empirical findings, and computational studies, it seems that the generation of predictions might be one strong candidate for such a universal pr principle. So that's a nice statement um, and one that I that I agree with 
But it leaves the question, how do you get from prediction to cognition? How can something as simple as prediction explain much of what we do? So I think one possible answer to that is to look at sense... Oh, I'm jumping ahead of myself slightly. Um, just to link in with last week, last week you talked a little bit about embodied cognition, and this is one of Verena's slides. Um, and she said the, that intelligence emerges from the interaction of an agent with an environment and as a result of sensory motor activity. So I'd like to highlight interaction and sensory motor activity and dig a little bit deeper. How is it that sensory motor activity can lead to intelligence? And what's that got to do with prediction? And I think one way to answer this is to look at the theories of sensory motor perception, in particular work by Kevin O'Regan. Um, so he says that according to sensory motor theories, our perception of the world and hence our categorization abilities are constructed from embodied sensory motor interactions with that world. So what does that mean? It means that this plate does not look round. I realize I'm pointing at my, <laughs> my computer <laughs> as I see myself on the screen. Right. This plate does not appear round because it projects a round image onto your retina. It rarely does that. Um, it looks round because you can predict how your movement will change your sensory contact with the plate. So if I move a little bit this way or I move a little bit that way, how will that change my view of this object? And that reveals a profile, an interaction profile, albeit a very simple one. And that that profile is what identifies round things as round or square things as square or a chair as a chair. A chair is something I can sit on. So instead of looking at a traditional computer vision, sort of look at a still image and work out what you're looking at, um, this is about predicting how you can interact with something. And that profile of interaction gives you a way to classify it. So a tree stump can be a chair, because if I want to sit on it. Equally, a chair could be not a chair at all. It could be a step if I want to reach high. It could be something to hide behind. It could be a weapon. It could be any number of things, depending on the context, on what it is, what actions you're trying to, to predict the consequences of. So an object's identity or category might lie in this, this profile of interaction that that it affords, and not only that it affords, but that you can predict. So when you see the handle on a door, um, you almost want to reach, you know, you want to reach out and turn it. And this has lots of nice implications as well. Um, if you took a traditional computer vision approach, and let's say you, you had a very successful system that that gave you a big long list of all the things that you can see in front of you. Well, that raises the question, what next? What are you going to do with that list? You need additional uh, mechanisms. You need additional uh, function to do planning or to, to work out what to do next. However, if you follow a sensory motor approach, then the fact that you can recognize an object out there means you already know how to interact with it. So you can, to a large extent, just be led by the world. Of course, there's bits of cognition that this doesn't explain. We can do planning, we can do reasoning. Um, but I think this does explain a, a large amount of what we do. It also means that for an infant, um, maybe there's a bookcase and lots of books on it. But why would they even perceive that? Perhaps they just don't see, perhaps they don't see it as anything different than a discoloration on the wall or the pattern of the wallpaper. It wouldn't make sense for them to perceive it as an entity in its own right um, unless they've had experience interacting with it and so can make the right kinds of predictions. So instead of cognition being in the head, as this slide is meant to uh, indicate. 
Is, our, is everyone's screen as slow as that? Or is it just yeah, it's a bit slow. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, so instead of cognition just being in the head, um, perhaps a better picture of cognition looks like this. <laughs> so it's about predicting how your actions will change your future sensory consequences. And from that, you can start to get to some perception of the world and, and knowing how to interact with things. So let's try and reel this back into to language. So that's setting the scene. Um, oh, yeah, right. So there's a video. Um, and I'll start talking while, while you, there we go. So if this video can just loop, that would be, that would be good. So let's look at a little bit more, you know, why would we want to believe this kind of sensory motor perception hypothesis? Well, when presumably most of you see the, the visual world at least as laid out in front of you. You perceive this rich world of objects and features. That, um, but in reality, the, uh, the light sensitive parts of your retina, the rods and cones in your retina, are focused on an area the size of your thumbnail at arm's length. So that's what you see in detail. As you move out from that focus point, there's yeah, just not. <laughs> there's not much there. So the the video that you're seeing now is um, a it's a a log polar um, distribution of uh, of sensitivity on a camera. So this is this is not quite what you see, but this is approximating the the information that the that the eyes are capable of gathering. So this shows us straight away that much of what we perceive must be constructed. It must be something that we've put together in our own heads, one way or another. Right, so back to the slides. And so that was that. There we go. Another nice bit of evidence comes from experiments by uh, Jeremy Goslin. And he, he was conducting psychology experiments with patients in, um, in uh, an EEG scanner. And he noticed something a little bit unexpected. And so started focusing on that. So he'd show people pictures like this. So they'd only see one of these pictures at a time. And what he found was lateralized activity in the motor cortex controlling the arm, that would control the arm and hand 90 milliseconds from onset. So 90 milliseconds after the image appears, you've got activity in the motor cortex controlling the arm that would pick the object up. So that could just be coincidence. Um, 90 milliseconds, by the way, is way before any kind of visual recognition has happened. But further to that, you can show that disruption in recognition or delay in recognition will happen if that part of the motor cortex was busy. So if you get, if you do something with your right hand, um, maybe squashing a squeezy ball or something like that, um, you will be slower and your recognition of objects will be disrupted if they're objects that you would pick up with your right hand. But the ones that you would pick up with your left hand remain undisrupted and vice versa. If you put the squeezy thing in your left hand and start, so you're using the, the motor cortex, it's active, this will now disrupt and delay um, recognition of objects that you would pick up with your left hand, but not with the right. So this is, there's mountains of this kind of um, evidence. There's loads of stuff in, new, in neuroscience that shows that we use the, uh, the sensory and motor structures we use the visual cortex when we close our eyes and imagine a visual scene. We use the motor cortex when we imagine doing activities. Um, but equally, we use the motor cortex when we recognize an object, even if we're inactive. So the suggestion, at least, is that we're constructing some kind of motor plan. 
Um, and that fits with the sensory motor idea that we're, we're doing some kind of simulation. If I perform this kind of action, what would the sensory consequences be? And they may facilitate the recognition um, by the visual cortex or whatever. Right, so I promised this would be about language. That's enough of a preamble. Um, so a nice quote from Andy Clark. He said, space, classification, and language are made for each other, with spatial indexing of various forms playing a major role in the learning of language, and language itself playing a cognitive role very similar to that of space. So what does he mean? What does this mean? Um, infants and children will learn word, word categories, visual categories, but also word categories, much, much quicker if you let them um, do sorting tasks. So let, putting all of the red things in a pile, putting all of the blue things in a different pile, or maybe putting all of the square things in a pile and all of the triangular things in another pile. Doing this facilitates the child's learning of these categories. Um, and so manipulating things in space in this way uh, not only helps classification, but also helps language. But equally, there's lots of things that you just can't do that with, that you can't spatially arrange. It's very difficult to put, pick up all the trees and move them into the same place, or the corners of a table. You can't gather them together without making more corners. So the suggestion here is that having words for objects lets you put them together, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, that you can cluster them. It goes a little bit deeper as well. well. Words are themselves manipulable objects, and experience with tags and labels can warp and reconfigure a problem space. I've got some nice examples of that um, that I can talk about in questions if, if people want to pursue that, but um, let's keep the focus now on language. So how is it that children learn language? Are there alternatives to the, the classic proposals that language is innate? Um, are there developmental step, stages in language learning? And is language learning tied to action? So the traditional view has been, um, as, as proposed by Fodor, Polition, Chomsky, Pinker, and many others, um, that language is innate. And the reason they think that is goes something like this. So the child is a passive observer of a, a cluttered scene, a mess of sensory information. And some instructor or caregiver or parent says a word, and the child is just clueless. What on earth does that word bind to in, in this? And that was seen as such a difficult problem that the only solution must be that language, that some parts of language at least must be innate. However, there is a different view, a different perspective. Um, people like Linda Smith and Esther Thielen criticize this passive view and say we must take a dynamical systems view. In reality, um, the child is not passive and the caregiver is rarely passive as well. Infant-directed speech and child-directed speech is usually about whatever the child's attention is focused on. So when the child is playing with an object or you know, looks at something and points and so on, then you might tell the child what the thing they're pointing at is or what the thing they're playing with is. It goes further as well. With infants especially, um, we're very likely to physically manipulate the child to direct the child to, uh, to the kinds of interactions that the objects they're playing with afford. Um, so this is to say that actually the problem isn't quite so hard if you label the things that the child is already attending to. So perhaps we can get started with some kind of language. Um, one of, one of my criticisms of so many models of language is that they're not language at all. They're labeling. Language goes a bit further than just tagging, linguistically tagging um, a, a 
visual feature or, or that kind of thing. So we need to we need to see if we can get further than this. But if we take this dynamical systems view, um, there's at least hope. We could start out by suggesting something like cross-situational learning. So let's just associate a word with all the features we see when we hear that word. So a child might see an image like this and hear the word car, but it doesn't know what a car is. So we could just weakly associate the, car, the word car to all of the features that we see. And the hope is that over a number of similar experiences, maybe different images, but the same word car, that gradually the, the statistics shape this so that car comes to latch on to the, the correct features and the incorrect ones um, just weaken out over time. Now this works. This can work. You can build models like this. And indeed, um, part of ERA works in exactly this way. But it's slow. It requires many examples. And it's very susceptible to false statistical relationships. So for example, if one block is often present, its statistical relationship can be biased. Maybe the car is completely occluded on some trials. What about the amount of time spent looking? What about noise? We are working with real world sensors here. Um, and another, well, the, the big problem here is that actually children can, can do one shot learning in ambiguous situations. So that's something we need to explain. And cross situational learning certainly does not get you one shot learning. So if we look at the developmental time course of language learning, we can, we can identify um, four <coughs> different state developmental stages. So a developmental stage is a prolonged period in which um, typical kinds of behavior, typical um, abilities, but also typical kinds of mistakes can be found. And usually we'll find some disruption um, in the transition between two developmental stages. So the first stage, so this is a timeline running left to right from birth to three years. And so we have a, that blue block on the left is I've labeled universal phonetic discrimination. And what this, in this stage, children and in, well, infants at this age are sensitive to single phoneme changes. So you can, you can repeat a, a, a word over and over and over and then at some point you change one phoneme in that word and the child notices. And that's true whether it's in native language or in non-native language. However, around eight months of age, this sensitivity drops off. And especially if you, if you pair the, the word with a visual stimuli, with, a vis with a, an image, um, then their sensitivity to individual phonemes changing almost disappears. But then somewhere between 14 and 18 months, it will come back, but now it only comes back for native language phonetics. So that moves us into this perceptual reorganization stage. So now it's all about what, uh, what I've previously experienced to some extent. Or another way of putting this um, is things with predictive utility. So things that are useful to help you do prediction. In this stage, word learning is very slow. So it's reasonable to suggest cross-situational learning um, is happening here. But towards, towards the end of this, somewhere around 20 to 24 months, we get a vocabulary spurt. And the child is learning new words at an exponential rate, sometimes 50, 60 new words a day. This is not so much in production, but in understanding, but also in production. At the same time, though, this is when the child will start producing short phrases, not just one word, one word things like dog or cat, um, but mummy bye bye or me milk and starting to put sense constructions. And there's lots of evidence that as they learn new words, they're also learning correct use of word order. So the new words will be put 
will be used in sentences in the correct order. Following this, um, we have this language production stage. This is where we have a gradual increase in linguistic manipulation. So I'm using Tomasello's terms here. He is exceedingly careful to avoid using the word grammar. But to put this in, uh, in traditional terms, what he's talking about is grammar learning. So there's, he reviews 28 experiments which um, all follow roughly the same methodology. So a child will watch a video of uh, an unusual action and the adult will say, oh, the cat is gawping the duck. Um, so this is, gawping is a, a new novel verb. Later on, the child will see a similar action and spontaneously construct a new sentence using that new word. Now, here's the trick. If when you said that word in the first place, you did so in an ingrammatical form, will the child reproduce your, your error or will the child correct the grammar? And what he found is that two-year-olds, um, only less than 10% of the time, two-year-olds will correct less than 10% two-year-olds will correct the error. So most of the time, more than 90% of the time, the two-year-olds will just reproduce the ingrammatical form. Five-year-olds, 90% of the time, they will correct the grammatical form. And in between, you have an almost perfectly linear relationship. So as the child gets older, they, be, they are increasingly likely to correct the grammatical form. So this is showing that it's not that they get the grammar straight away, as the, the innate, um, as the language is innate argument would suggest, but rather that this is a gradual process. So I'm going to look at robotic models of experiments throughout these stages. And I'm going to ask another question as well. Can developmental stages arise just from experience? <clears throat> so most models, not all, but most of the models of developmental stages. They work in one of two different ways. Either some new mechanism is switched on to move it from one, one tip, stereotypical behavior to another developmental stage of, of typical behavior, or they have a parameter change. So if you set the parameter to one value, you get behavior in one developmental stage. If you change the parameter value, you get behavior in the other. In, in a different stage. So this is a valid way of modeling, um, but it's, and, and we shouldn't outright reject this idea because clearly things like this do happen. There are maturational stages. There are, you know, puberty is a really good example of something that really changes your cognitive, your cognition, and it's down to hormones and you know, parameter changes. Um, so there's lots of these things going on. But maybe that isn't the only way to explain it. Maybe some developmental stages arise just from experience. So I'm going to show some replications of five different child psychology experiments that span across this, uh, these developmental stages. Um, and this all arises from a single model in ongoing learning with no parameter changes, no switching anything on or off. So I'll show you what that model looks like. If the slides catch up, <laughs> I shouldn't have these gradual transitions, should I? Um, so this is a very, this is actually quite a simplistic model. It's, and there's many reasons for that, but we'll, we'll stick with this model. So we have a bunch of self-organizing maps. And each of these self-organizing maps is going to get input from a different kind of modality. So we've got one on body posture. We've got one looking at the color of objects. We've got one looking at shape information from objects. We've got words and phonemes. Um, we've got actions. And what we're going to do is use something as simple as heavy and learning um, to associate these together. And there is some structure to, to how that's done. Um, but the key thing is we're just we're going to use that as, um, as a very simple way of modeling priming, uh, of prediction. 
So if A and B co-occur, next time you see A, predict B. In addition to that, this model has a, a slightly more complicated part. We use an echo state network um, to do word order learning. And I'll talk more about that um, later on. So how on earth can that give you this kind of behavior and go through these developmental trans transitions? Well, in the first step, we have this universal phonetic discrimination. Now, self-organizing maps are good at providing discrimination. They're also good at providing discrimination over things that they have not yet seen. So this explains why a child can possibly, or by the model at least, will be able to discriminate non-native language phonemes. So that's our starting point. Now, we're trying to associate these sums together. We're trying to build connections between them. But something a little bit strange happens. Um, initially, the sum hasn't settled down. So you might see the color red and hear the word red. And a, a particular neuron in the, the color sum becomes active in response to red. And a particular neuron in the word map becomes responsive to the word, uh, to the word red. So you strengthen the connection between them a little bit. However, next time you see red, you see the color red and you hear the color red, different neurons might respond. And so you, build, you strengthen a different connection, and perhaps you weaken the one that you previously strengthened. So what happens is that this, these associations can't get any purchase. They don't get anywhere until the sums have, have settled down. So you have this period initially where you have uh, this universal disc discrimination and um, not much going on in the, in the learning relationships between them. But once they start to settle down, these relationships start to grow. Now, we also modify the, the SOM learning rule so that the SOM is not merely driven by the external input, by the sensory input, but it's also being driven by the priming by these associations. So as these associations get stronger, there's, in a way, a new form of input available to the sum. And the result is that as these connections get strong, the sum undergoes some, uh, some additional change. You get a period, short period of disruption, and then, uh, then it's stable again. But now the sum is, going, is focused to increase the sensitivity to things that are predictively useful at the cost of things that are not predictively useful. And so you lose non-native phonetic discrimination. So this moves us into the perceptual reorganization developmental stage. And, and now we're doing something like cross-situational learning. And we're just doing it with simple heavy and learning. So this is what we've called um, neural readiness. So there's this transition. It's not, to be absolutely clear, it's not that we switched on the Hebbian learning at some point and that transitioned it. The Hebbian learning was there right from the outset. It just couldn't get any purchase until something else had happened first. Another thing that children can do and adults too. So if you look at this picture and I ask you, um, where's the apple? Hopefully you all point to the thing in the middle. Um, if I ask you, where's the DAX? Hopefully that's a word that you've not heard before. Um, you're most likely to take a guess and point at the, the weird thing on the right that you haven't seen before. And this is exactly what children do as well. <coughs> so this is called fast mapping. Um, because I know that that's an apple and that's a car, this thing that I don't know must be what that novel word is binding to. So in the model, it works something like this. So we see a box and we see a stapler, and that means um, various box features and various stapler features 
become active. Now we've seen boxes before, so because we've built these associations, the word box gains some activity, it's primed, um, but actually we hear the word stapler. Now, because box and stapler are both words, they're in the same field, they inhibit each other. So stapler inhibits box, and because box is positively connected to the box features, that negative activity over a positive link reduces the activity of the box features. So stapler will now bind to everything it sees. It binds to the stapler features as well as the box features. However, it will bind more weakly to the box features and more strongly to the stapler features. So it just it's not something that we've designed in. This is, this is looking at the dynamics of this kind of model. So why have I suddenly jumped to talking about um, about fast mapping. Well, the next stage is a vocabulary spurt. And we've replicated lots of psychology data on fast mapping, and I'll, I'll very briefly show you some of that shortly. Um, and also on learning word order cues, and again, I'll talk about that shortly. But in combination, this massively reduces the ambigu ambiguity of a situation to allow one-shot word learning in relatively complex situations. So let's, um, I think, yeah, if we can show the next video. So all of the objects here are things that iCub has never seen before. It hasn't seen the objects this is or the features. Star. What is this? Orange star. Orange star. So that's ambiguous. There was only one object in its view. Uh, not ambiguous. So it knows the other things are orange star. This must be the red ball. So that's mutual exclusivity. But also, at this stage in its development, it's learned something about word order. So it thinks red is an attribute. And it can see the hammer on the left is the same color as the ball. So this new word blue must indicate the other object. So now we can add lots of objects and again ask it to pick up something new. So what's, what this has shown is that actually it's learnt in one shot um, novel words for novel objects in, actually, in a relatively complex and somewhat ambiguous situation. So, so what's going on here? Well, I should mention the, the word, I keep promising to talk about word order cues. So before you can even begin to learn word order cues, you must first learn some words. It's, you can't possibly hope to learn word order cues um, if all of the words are just unknown novel things. So you have to build up some uh, some knowledge about at least some words. Once you once you know what a sm subset of words map to, you can start to realise that they come in a particular order. Um, so, for example, if I use the novel word Dax, if I say pick up the Dax car, um, Dax is probably some kind of attribute of the car. If I say pick up the red Dax, now Dax is is the label of an object. So its position in the sentence changes, its, changes what it could possibly bind to. So first, you've got to learn, you've got to get a, a, a vocabulary of words that you learn through slow cross-situational learning. But having done that, um, once that information is available, you can generalize it to novel words. And so that's what's, that's what's going on. And that 
leads you into the vocabulary spurt through the kinds of, of model that you just saw in that video. So this is perceptual readiness. There's actually some information that you needed before you could learn the next thing. So I've, I've mentioned the gradual acquisition of grammar already. Um, this is a table from Thomas Sallow's Tick's paper in 2000, um, looking at the, how likely the children were to correct the grammatical mistake um, according to their age. Now I'll skip over this, I think. Um, so the way this grammar learning system happens in the model, we have a, an echo state network, um, which is there on the left. So it gets as input the words in the order that they come in, but it also gets uh, as the output that it's trying to predict, not which action or which color or which shape becomes active, but the degree to which they become active by priming. So this word primes an action. That word primes a color. And so it's just, it's trying to learn this relationship, not between individual words and, uh, and features, but between, uh, from, the, from the sentence construction, from the ordering of words um, and so on. And so its predictions can be used to, uh, <coughs> To, to, uh, to change the learning rate on connections to different fields. So to, to amplify or subdue learning of to colors, shapes, actions, and so on. So this is just learned again from ongoing experience. And that's how the model works. So the, uh, so this is showing the U-shaped performance um, in phoneme recognition. So at the early stage, so if we look at the graph on the left, at the early stage we have high uh, performance at discriminating <coughs> phonemes, and then we get a dip after a period of time. Um, this is when the, uh, the associative learning is starting to get a foothold, and then it comes back, but now it comes back only for, um, for the known stuff. We've looked at all sorts of things in fast mapping, looking at uh, the effect of how, how you vary features between different exposures and how that affects category membership. Um, we've looked at how the number of distractors changes things. So in this graph, the light blue is child's data, the dark blue is data from the model, from the robot. Um, look, and the conditions there are how many known objects are present. So if there's two known objects and one unknown, then we have a, a good chance of the novel word being mapped to the, the novel object. As you get more words, you fall to chance levels. Um, we've looked at how varying features, so this graph is slightly different. The graph on the left is the child data. The graph on the right is robot data. Um, so again, we have a a pretty good match to the child data here. And what's interesting is that if, if the known objects and the novel objects are all the same color, then the child is able to generalize. Um, that's the, the bars on the far right of each graph. Um, however, if, if the known objects and the novel objects are different colors, then their generalization is pretty poor. So again, cap capturing in detail a variety of child data. We've done non-language stuff as well, well, so semi-language stuff. Um, this was work um, replicating bodily biases in learning and showing how posture affects word learning. So what I've talked about is um, a model that starts with starts knowing nothing and initially the way that you can interact with it is very limited well you can interact with it however you like but what it what it gets starts off being very limited so single words to start with then it starts getting um, small sentence constructions from piano to red piano um, to starts to pick up actions 
Um, where is the DAX? Pick up the team. And th uh, over time, these get increasingly complex. So you can start getting like up to put the ball in the cup and so on. So these are, are re you know, still relatively simple sentence constructions. Um, but this is you know, at the level of what uh, an infant and young child would, would be able to do. So this is a model of sensory motor perception, which over time and without switching any mechanisms on or off and without changing any parameters, it will naturally transition through multiple developmental stages, replicating multiple child psychology experiments. So let's try and connect this back to where we started. Um, I mean, how plausible is this account? Well, there's lots of neuroscientific data supporting these ideas. Um, this is a quote from Galassi and Lakoff. Uh, Galassi is the neuroscientist, Lakoff is a linguist. And they proposed that the sensory motor system has exactly the right kind of structure to characterize not only sensory motor, um, but also more ab abstract concepts. The sensory motor regions are exploited to characterize the so-called abstract concepts that constitute the meanings of grammatical constructions and general inference patterns. So I have the quote that I started with from Moshi Barr at the top there. Um, Is it possible that much of the brain and mind's operation can be explained with a small set of universal principles? Given exciting recent developments in theory, empirical findings and computational studies, it seems that the generation of predictions might be one strong candidate for such a universal principle. So what I hope I've done in this lecture is show that from prediction, we can get to something like sensory motor perception and this simulation hypothesis. That through modeling, we can demonstrate developmental stages and transitions. And by actually using a real robot, we can interact with it, we can, we can replicate child psychology experiments um, to a degree that you can't do in, in a, a purely number crunching model. Um, so we're replicating these psychology experiments and findings. And the key is that this means we can make useful predictions. So what I mean by that, and so we have made some predictions and gone and tested them in children and so far found them to be true, so that's good. Um, but I actually mean this in more of an ex explanation kind of way. So, for example, in psychology, this, uh, this change from universal phonetic discrimination into now only you know, having this disruption where phonetic discrimination becomes difficult and then it comes back in only the native language. The standard explanation for that in the psychology literature is that this is a resource allocation problem, that the brain's too busy doing something else. Now, that might be so. And in a way, we, we kind of agree with that because the, the brain is doing other things. Um, but it doesn't let you make any predictions. Why would vocabulary size be a predictor of when this sensitivity will come back? And it is a predictor. So we can say why. We can start saying which, um, which, uh, yeah, we, we can say from what the child can learn, we can predict when these transitions are going to happen, which you certainly can't do with a resource allocation type of account. So it gives you more explanatory power. So actually, the top quote there is again, is the same quote from Barr. Um, So these are quotes from all sorts of sources, mainly quite old actually. There's a remarkable synchronization of speech milestones with motor development milestones. Well, why would that be? And perhaps this approach, I'm not saying that I have answers to all of these. What I'm saying is this approach to developmental robotics can start to give you explanatory power over, over these things. There's an increased, an increased rhythmic arm 
movement coincides with the onset of reproducible babble. That seems a bit strange. Um, developments in object displacements in play are related to the first words and the vocabulary spurt. This one seems fairly obvious that in terms of sensory motor learning, you know, you're learning how to interact with objects. Of course, those are going to be the first objects that you really start to perceive and therefore the things that you start to talk about. Um, there's many, many more examples of this kind of stuff. I just threw that in there to as support of what this approach could potentially um, you know, open up to start explaining these things that in psychology are observed um, but not well understood. So I'll wrap up there. Um, a quick thank you to lots of collaborators for the, the work on iCub and ERA. Um, but I've not just talked about that, I've talked about other people's work from Newell to uh, Kevin O'Regan's sensory motor perception and so on. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> we have plenty of time for questions. Anyone want to start? No. Okay, we have a question here. Yeah, sorry, when you talk about native language, are you talking as in the kind of language they're learning from their parents, or is that yeah. something different? No, um, so uh, <coughs> a classic example is that um, children brought up in a Chinese speaking environment, a non English environment, um, can't hear the difference between r and l whereas we can. And equally, there are, and I have videos of this and I can't, but there are phonemes in Chinese that they, we, I cannot tell the difference between them. And, um, now, obviously, if you're in a bilingual environment, that would be different. So it's about what you're exposed to. And that ties in with predictive utility. Is it useful to be able to recognize phonemes that aren't used? Other questions? Just open your microphone. Um, do we have a question from William? Okay. okay. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, what I would uh, like to know, if you had a, a phonetic representation of the vocabulary or did you have an alphabetic representation of the words? Um, actually, I had both. So to reproduce the data from, uh, from the phoneme tasks, we used um, male frequency co-spectrum input um, and classified it with a sum. So this is really poor um, and not, not very good at recognizing phonemes. But some phonemes, um, ooh, ah, and the, these kinds of phonemes, can easily be discriminated in using that that approach, um, but phonetic recognition, phonetic speech recognition, is n notoriously difficult. Um, there are some there people are making some good progress at the moment. Um, so, in addition to that, we uh, we use Dragon Dictate as a sort of speech, an open speech to text um, method, and then use that text. To, to form a dictionary, and each neuron was attached to a different word in the dictionary. And the dictionary was created in an ad hoc way as it went in learning. In learning. So we, we so did that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, any more questions? All right, um, I, have I have one. I have one. So, so right now the actions that you're performing are um, they're kind of discrete rest representation. So how do you how do you think we should go about moving towards tying this type of model up to something more uh, like sensory motor coordination and what effects can that have on the on the model? I yeah, that's I think that's a really important question. I think that's what 
where this this kind of research needs to go. Um, if you, I, I have a, I haven't got it here, I'm afraid, but I have a great video of one of my children when she was nine months old. Um, you know these toys that you press the button and a, a door opens and you press a different button and a door opens. Anyway, she just started getting the hang of this. She she just worked it out, but she hadn't worked it out the way that you would expect. What she'd worked out is that what she had to do was turn this thing over, upside down, sit on it, <laughs> shuffle off, turn it back, and the doors open, much to her delight. Um, but the whole process was slapping it, banging it, and so on. And it, I, this is a video I often show to um, ro robotics people who are m perhaps more engineering oriented. That the you know, iCub moves in a very prescribed and specific way. My daughter was slapping the hell out of this thing and, and accidentally made this discovery. So I think the first thing is most of the, the, kind, the traditional kind of robots that we have, iCub included, um, there's no way you could do that. You, you would just break iCub instantly. So we need passive dynamic, you know, we, we need robots that are more robust that can just um, start to explore, slap things around. Um, and we, on the non-motor side, we also need to be able to, to visually perceive the consequences of actions, um, even if that's just in a, you know, probably initially a very crude way to notice that something's moved or to notice that, mm. that something's form has changed. Mm. But, mm. I think it's a I, I have a question. How, uh, what, may you comment, what's your view on the Chinese room uh, experiment? So, are you, is, what's wrong in the Chinese room uh, experiment from your point of view? If um, It's a Cartesian, it's Cartesian dualism. So, there isn't, there isn't a little homunculus in your head watching a, a, a video screen of what you see through your eyes. And there isn't a homunculus in homunculus's head. So equally, if you put a person in the Chinese room, you put a homunculus in there, and you're trying to explain why the homunculus has learnt language. The room, the system, has learnt language. That's, that's yeah. my view. The room understands Chinese, albeit in a very good old-fashioned AI kind of way, because it has a rule book, a set of instructions which it follows. So I don't think there's conscious experience or anything like that, um, and I don't think there ever would be from a good old-fashioned AI rule-following um, way of doing things. I think it's something more like statistical learning is is what we do. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, 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 thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Okay. Well, I think we, uh, we can thank the speaker again, and uh, then we'll go for uh, take a um, 10 minute break, and we'll be back uh, 20 past. All right, so I thank the speaker again. Okay.